If you're anything like me, you can spend hours trying to create the perfect selfie for the lighting, to what you're wearing, to where you're at, whether it's a beach or on vacation somewhere or at a wedding. But when you stop and think about it, what we're trying to project is somewhat a false impression of who we are. It's definitely not us as we wake up or the person who goes grocery shopping. It's a faux version of ourselves. We then post this picture and put it out to the world. But have we ever stopped to think why we do this? Is this something new in history? Or perhaps is it something that is as old as humanity itself? I recently did a peculiar thing. I visited the historic cemetery in Sacramento. And on this nice spring day, most people go to the park the beach, the river, and enjoy themselves in the outdoors. I, on the other hand, chose to go to a place that most people avoid. Now, the Romans would have felt completely at home in this historic cemetery because death, much like many uh, ancient civilizations, was part of everyday life. And they incorporated it into their lives with ceremony and art. Now, for you and I walking around most modern day cemeteries, we're used to having tombstones, small or a little bit larger, with the name of the deceased and the dates of their lives. Now, the materials used here would have been something that the Romans would have felt comfortable with. The granite, the marble, the names inscribed on them. But the Romans didn't have the luxury of space like we did. So, a lot of those who were buried were cremated, placed in an urn, and then put into a crypt beneath the ground and provided with a small niche where they can then put that urn into and come year after year to pay homage to their deceased friends and relatives. But let's be honest, the Romans never missed an opportunity to put on a show. Burying their dead was only a small portion of the death ceremony. The bigger, more spectacular event was the funerary parade. Now, a parade when someone dies isn't exactly something you and I would think of, but if you've ever been to a funeral, a lot of times after a ceremony, there will be a procession of cars. You may have been part of that or have been stopped by those patrol vehicles that stop traffic allowing this procession of vehicles. For Romans, it was much more celebratory. And there was a sense of both missing, but also celebrating the individual who had passed. You'd have to actually visit New Orleans to really get a sense of what I'm talking about in the jazz funerals that they have now. Um, sometimes people refer to them as second line, but it's a much more jovial celebration of the individual. For the Romans, it wasn't just a procession, it was a bit of a festival. They went as far as to even pay for professional whalers who weren't affiliated with the person who passed. Not the Romans paid these professional whalers to essentially put on a dramatic act. They would cry and wail and scream so that it would create a spectacle and the sense of importance for the person who had passed. And of course, it's a business, so the whalers who put more effort into it would, at the end of it, pass out their business cards to get business for the next series of individuals who would pass. Someone it would even go as so far as to pull their hair out, as you can see in this early Roman funerary relief. Now, this idea of professional whalers continues, and you can even go to the island of Sardinia off the coast of Italy, where you see this tradition still carry on. Now, many historians have argued that these funerary processions that the Romans put on over time morphed to be part of the Catholic Church's celebrations and festivities on particular saints' days, where you have processions and crowds and the clergy marching through the streets of Italy, celebrating the 
important individuals of the Catholic Church. The bigger point about these death parades that the Romans put on was to create such a spectacle that people viewing the spectators among the streets of Rome would view this and think, God, this individual must have been somebody quite important. And so the idea of the individual really rises in Rome. And what better way to celebrate and promote oneself than by taking a selfie? Or at least the Roman version of a selfie. When you enter into the historic cemetery of Sacramento, you first approach several historic portraits of those who are buried here. And those portraits would have resonated not just with us in our modern world with our selfies and our cameras on our phones, but it would have also resonated with the Romans. The Romans not only put on these funerary parades, but they also created death mass, and they probably created these masks well before the individual passed. And so that an artist would actually make a mold, first and foremost, of the individual's face, then fill that mold with some kind of wax material, and it would be put aside so that at one day when this individual passed, it would be brought out to celebrate this individual in the funerary procession. They took it one step further because they hired an actor or an actress to wear this mask and to embody that individual during the parade so that we had this kind of living reenactment, if you will, of the deceased. Some of the more wealthier Romans actually paid actors to study them while they were living so they can catch all those little nuances, those ticks that we all have, how they carry themselves, how they move. All that was part of the experience of the Roman funerary procession. When the funerary procession was done and the events of that day were completed, this death mass was placed on the wall with all the other past ancestors of that family. So that when you walked into the house of a Roman, and particularly those who were more well off, you would be first introduced to this Facebook wall, if you will, where this wax replica of your face would be placed on this wall with all the other past ancestors so that you could see the connection and the heritage of your family with all those important members. If you had a senator or somebody who was in the military or did some particularly big deed, these were the individuals who were placed on the wall alongside yours so that you can make these connections and make yourself even more important. Much like any social media app, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or countless others, it's not just a place to place pictures of us and promote ourselves, but we can give value to ourselves by letting people know who we're connected to. Our followers and our friends say as much about ourselves as a photo does. So this wall of faces is a way for these Romans to connect themselves to their important fam family past. No other work really defines this than this sculpture here. And you can see it's a living Roman who's in a toga and standing. And on either side of him are these busts or these wax death masks. And thus what he's doing is he's showing us he's important not only because there's a portrait of him done, but because of those forefathers that came before him and his connection to those individuals. Now, wax melts. It doesn't really last all that long. And unfortunately, we have little to no evidence of these wax faces, but we do have a lot written about it. So how did the Romans take their wax death masks and transfer those images into marble, an unforgiving material? So this here is called the Machina Punti, which is essentially the point machine. And the Romans actually invented this thing. And the reason they invented it is because they so loved Greek sculpture that they wanted to have copies of them. So what they did was create a system that would allow them to copy it as precise as possible. Now, if you were somebody of importance and had money, you would invite your guests over and in your garden, you would have copies of Greek sculpture. It was a way of kind of keeping up with the Joneses. 
so many were made that many of the Greek sculptures that you see in museums are actually Roman copies. The originals were lost because if they were in bronze, they were melted down, or if they were in marble, they were broken at some point in history. So in some respects, we owe this machine to a better understanding, not only Roman sculpture, but also Greek sculpture. As a sculptor myself, I was able to study in Italy and visit the quarries, the same quarries that the Romans used to excavate the marble that they used for many of the busts that we're going to be looking at. And there I learned how to use this point machine by an old Italian artisan who on a daily basis walked me through how to use this thing. So what you're looking at here is a plaster sculpture that I created. And you can see the face here, hands and this water flowing around it. I use this to then transfer the points, which I'll explain in a bit, from the plaster to the marble sculpture. It is not an easy process. Painstaking, dirty, your hands hurt, but in the end, this allows you to create an exact copy. So I'm going to walk you through the steps of how I've made this sculpture that I made in plaster into marble. Let's assume that it's a Roman death mass. I would first measure out the whole sculpture and create three what are called mother points, the top and the bottom two sides. The next I would choose a piece of marble and replicate those three mother points by measuring on the stone exactly where they lay on the original plaster sculpture. Having done that, I would then make this what's called a wooden cross, a croce. And so pieces of wood that then have three nails that correlate to those three mother points. And they sit precisely on those three points on the marble. They then also, because they're measured precisely, those nails fit exactly on the three main points of the original plaster sculpture. Now that we've done that, we take what's called the machina punti, this Roman invention that essentially is has a series of clamps and tighteners that allow this large needle to move in and out. And for lack of a better term, we are essentially graphing out this plaster sculpture. So we adhere this machina punti to the croce, the wooden cross, and as you remember, it fits perfectly on the original plaster sculpture. So we then move this needle. And we're, what we're doing is, remember it's called a machina punti, a point machine. We're essentially going to be grabbing points on the surface. And it's like a three-dimensional mapping of the surface of the sculpture. And you always, when you begin a sculpture, want to start with the part that protrudes farthest out. In this case, it's the nose. And so then we push that needle in, we tighten everything down, and what you're going to find, and it hits exactly on the top of the nose here. I would place a pencil mark on here denoting exactly where this is so that when I return, the needle will hit it right on the nose, no pun intended. And then when we take that machina punti and put it on the marble, it'll hit marble and this machine here will simply tell me that the gap between one brass section and the other will tell me how much marble sculpture I need to cut before I arrive on that point inside the marble. I, I know it's a bit complicated, but trust me, it's a way of mapping out point by point, surface by surface, because again, marble is not a forgiving material. So then you then begin to carve the marble down. You start to graph out your points and begin to carve gently pieces of the marble down so that you can begin to replicate your original sculpture. So it looks almost like it's broken out in some kind of pimples along the surface. And so point by point, and this sculpture that I had has hundreds if not thousands of points. If you look closely, you see all the pencil marks that I made. And slowly but surely, this gets graphed, will be replicated in the marble sculpture. 
if this seems a little bit familiar, it's actually evolved into being part of movie making. And if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings and Gollum, it's one of the first times where we had an actor who wore this contraption in which he had these points on his face that allowed the CG artists, artists to replicate Gollum in a very humanistic way from the eyes, the cheeks, the nose, and the mouth, and ultimately the emotions. And so the Romans invent this thing to originally copy Greek sculptures, to then copy wa death, wax death masks into marble, and here we are uh, many, many years later using them for the cinematic experience. And voila, getting back to my sculpture, here is the completed sculpture in marble. Graft using the Machina Punti point by point over many days and months. And so when we go visit a museum and we're confronted with one of these Roman sculpted busts, we can better understand who these people were, the desire of their family and loved ones to keep a memory of them, the ceremony in which they were buried, and the sheer amount of artistic work it took to create one of these marble busts. If, as if that wasn't enough, the artist painted these marbled crafted surfaces with realistic paint so that there were flesh tones, eye colors, hair color, the occasional addition of lipstick and makeup to make these individuals come alive as if they were standing right in front of us. And let's not forget, this is the whole point of these works. It's to capture the spirit and the memory of these lost individuals. Unlike our own Facebook pages that always seem to catch us at our best, maybe at a wedding, dress really well, or on a vacation at a beach with a drink in our hand and the sun glowing on our faces, the Romans wanted to create the unfiltered portrait of themselves because they wanted people to recognize who they were. It's of no value to them if they create a portrait of themselves that looks nothing like them or is a faux version of themselves. Only the emperors would do something like that. The sheer fact that there was money paid to sculpt and paint these individuals automatically gives them value, which was the point from the beginning, from the funerary parades to the death masks to the death wall or the Facebook wall in their homes to the crafted marble bust with the painted surfaces. So in the end, really, what's so fascinating about Roman veristic sculpture is it's almost as if we're looking at ourselves. And not much has changed. They used marble and paint. We use digital JPEG photos and social media, both designed to give us an inflated sense of ourselves and both capturing this deep human desire to record who we were, why we were significant, and what we accomplished during our life here on Earth.